Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word book of Luke, we're going to book of Luke. We're going to finish the book today. We what what a light giver Luke is, being the meaning thereof, lightening your life with truth, showing you the way, even in a dark, dark world, and um, the old Prince of Darkness on every corner. But this light always gives you that clarity and makes that that is um, that should not be in the in the the shadow of darkness as you shine that light forth that gives you life prosperity leadership and peace of mind that's so valuable especially in this generation is to know our father is in control and that we have that victory we christ had been crucified and he had resurrected however The word hadn't gotten around and they were kind of, even though he had let them know, three days later I'm going to resurrect and I will meet you back at home. But it seems that kind of slipped away from them. Even two of them have gone down to Emmaus to take some warm baths and they're talking on the roadway coming back home and um, they, Jesus falls right in with them and walks with them, but it was holding from them so they would not recognize him. That's for a reason. In this end generation, there's one going to claim to be Messiah. Are you going to walk with him? Or can you tell the difference? Will you recognize the true Christ? They didn't recognize him here because it was withholding from them. But you see, If you believe that Christ has already returned, you're sure not going to be expecting him, although the one that claims to have returned is the fake. Our Father's word warns you over and over about that. See that you're not deceived. Certainly here in this book of Luke, he warned you about it. And I feel this is the example set forth here by our Father with these two as a warning to you. So as they continue walking with Christ back, it's about a seven and a half mile walk. And um, we'll pick it up then in, uh, in the chapter 24, verse 18. And let's go with it and finish this book of Luke. And verse 18 reads, And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? And hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And you see, they're even calling him a stranger. Now, this is an Aramaic name. It is, it is really Cleopatros, not Cleopas. It's Cleopatros, which means father of renown. Many scholars believe that it is the father of James the Less. Be that as it may, doesn't matter. But um, they walk along and and not recognizing because it was withholding from them. Verse 19, and he said unto them, what things? What are you talking about? And they said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people. Verse 20, I mean, here's walking with them. They don't recognize him and they're saying this to him. Verse 20, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. They went through with it. They accomplished it. Verse 21, but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Now that should have given them a clue there to kind of jar them out of it because it was the third day that he promised he would return. He would re- resurrect, 
that he would be with them, and yet it would seem that they never absorbed that. Was it because they did not want to face the fact that he would be crucified? It certainly isn't a pleasant thing, but thank God that he loved us enough that he brought that to pass so that in doing so he defeated death, which is to say the devil. And how precious it is that we have the freedom to follow, to know, to, to love, and to the, the very word itself, and have that repentance. Repentance is a wonderful thing because we all fall short at one time or the other. And after repentance, you have that clean page and, and uh, right in the very book of life and how precious it is. 22, yea, and, and certain women also of our company made us astonished. We were amazed, uh, which were early at the sepulchre. This would be Mary Magdalene and the others that had gone down. What did they claim? 23, and when they found not his body, they came saying that they had been, had also seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive. Now, it wasn't a vision. They actually saw the angels. The angels were there. And naturally, the angels had said, why do you look among the dead for the living? For Christ is alive, naturally. We have a father that is the father of the living, not the dead. And the only thing dead is flesh bodies, spiritual bodies, None have deceased at this time. They certainly will at the great white throne judgment at the end of the millennium. Verse 24, And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre and found it even, as, even so as the women had said. But him they saw not. And here's that doubt comes in again. They rushed down there. They saw the tomb was empty well enough but they didn't find the Lord Jesus Christ. And there that doubt came in. This is where you want to be very careful, my friend. The reason that Psalms 22 was written a thousand years before the fact of every detail basically that happened while he was nailed to that cross is to strengthen your faith in this word. As it is written, it will come to pass. It shall. You can count on it. And, and God cannot give you a better guarantee than that to just take doubt and chase it away because of the truth of the Word of God, the true light that this great book of Luke brings us. Uh, and, and so it is. And when that doubt kind of showed its little face, what happened, verse 25, then he said unto them, this would be Christ speaking, O Fools, this is dullards, and slow of heart, slow of mind, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. You're supposed to, and you're a little bit dull to what has been written. Psalms 22, that he would be crucified, that there would be a generation set aside, and, and um, the whole word of God as it is written. Verse 26, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? I mean, didn't he have the right to do this? Didn't, was it not his obligation to suffer these things and enter into glory so that he could pull all those that believe with him, giving life eternal, forgiveness of sins, as what? As it's written. Have you ever read it? That's what's important. These two are blocked mentally for the time being as a lesson to us today. Make sure you do not fall into this category where Christ himself would have to call you a dullard. Okay, that, that means a little slow catching on. It means doubt can erase um, fact from your mind if you're not careful whereby you don't, you don't uh, face the simplicity which is in the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ right in your face. It's right before you. 27, you know what he did then? And beginning at Moses 
and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the, see, the things concerning himself. What would he do then? Well, he, all, Moses was the writer of the Pentateuch, <clears throat> which goes all the way to the book of Genesis. And what, what does Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 declare? It's first prophecy in the Bible concerning the serpent seed and the seed of the woman, which is to say Christ, that they, there would be this controversy between them, and boy, certainly it is, and that the serpent seed offspring, Kenites, would bruise the heel of the woman's seed, which is to say Christ. He was nailed to the cross. But the second part is that the woman's seed, that is to say Christ, will bruise the head or crush the head of the serpent. That's why it is written in Hebrews 2, 14, Christ died on the cross to, to destroy death, which is to say the devil. He's defeated. That's the first prophecy way back in Genesis chapter 3, foretelling of this event, that he would be crucified. His heel would be bruised whereby the reason, the purpose even given there as to why the heel would be bruised, why it would come to pass. And, um, and, and again, way back in Deuteronomy chapter 18, you're not going to have it, but listen to this. Have you ever read it? Deuteronomy 18, what does it promise? 15, chapter 18, verse 15 of Deuteronomy. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him you shall hearken. Those are the words of Moses. He's going to raise somebody up in the flesh. That would be the Lord Jesus Christ, of course. That you're going to be able to look at. Why? Well, when they went down to the foot of that mountain and they heard the voice of God and saw the fire, it frightened them to death. But when they would see this one in his own likeness, the Lord Jesus Christ, a prophet, then maybe they could listen. According to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more that I die not. They could not stand the very presence on that mountaintop of Yahweh himself. It was overpowering to them. And this is his promise. I'm going to send you, in other words, this would be the fulfillment of, of uh, John chapter 1, where it would say, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Because the Word became flesh and walked among us in this one, whereby no one was frightened or had a right to be as they did at the mountain that day, thinking they would die, 17. And the Lord had said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. They've well said it. The presence of God could cause you to die, 18. I will raise them up a prophet from among their, thy, their brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth. He was the living word. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. That's the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ from the Sermon on the Mount to every statement he made as he walked this earth in that flesh, the living word walking among us. 19. And it shall come to pass, not maybe, it shall come to pass, that whosoever will not hearken unto my words which he shall speak in my name, I'll require it of him. And, and so it is. And uh, they are held accountable. And verse 20, But the prophet, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or they shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. In other words, when that false Christ comes and those that try to announce his coming, those that would come against the woman's seed, which is to say the Lord Jesus Christ, they're in a heap of hurt. They're playing church. But this is why Christ would say in, in Luke 21 and Matthew 24 and Mark 13, 
uh, many will come in my name, see that you're not deceived. Claiming to be Christian preachers, watch them. Watch what they say. Does it align with God's word? Verse 21. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? How, how can we tell? How can we be sure? 22. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, makes that claim, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. He's lying to you. But the prophet hath, hath spoken it presumptuously, Thou shalt not be afraid of him. Why? He's not a prophet. He's a fake, a phony. Well, uh, the, there's where our Father said, I'm going to send someone that you'll be able to communicate with, that you'll be able to understand, that you will know and recognize as someone that can lead you. The word coming from his mouth will be the word of God. And everything that he speaks will come to pass as it's written. That's why you can trust the word of the living God. That's how you, that is the proof. That is the proof that the word is true and is the word of God because it always, I mean, time after time, always comes to pass exactly as it is written. So um, many times as he took them all the way back to Moses, as he would he would take them to um, many places uh, whereby uh, in speaking from Moses, he would take them to Psalm 16 and, uh, and he would take them to Isaiah 7, 14. What is written in Isaiah 7, 14? What's the writings of, uh, that would come forth even by the great prophet Isaiah that a virgin should conceive and a, a man-child would be born, and you would name him Emmanuel, being interpreted, which is to say God with us. Uh, and uh, not only there, but in, in um, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, uh, and chapter 40, verse 10, and 11, and 56, he is the branch, he is the servant of God, he is the Son of God. And on it would go, Jeremiah 23, he's the, and... Um, uh, 33, 14, he's the branch, the very branch with us. What's the branch? Jumek, uh, which is to say the uh, branch or the shoot off of God himself. Over and over from Moses' writings to this day, we have these proofs for you to partake of, to, to uh, imbib within your very soul itself, to become knowledgeable and with an understanding of the word of God, which he sent through the mouths of the prophets, and again, using his own, um, own uh, uh, words, then he becomes that one. Then, not to stop there, Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 25, he was the prince, the prince of our people. And then, I could go on and on, we could take the great book of Daniel, where there he is, uh, we even have the, in chapter 9, we have Christ as Messiah. And then we have another prince there with the lowercase p. And that prince is none other than Satan himself as the false prophet, as the false Christ. And through that gap period, that last week out of the seventy. It is held in reserve for that time that that false one would be on earth, would take away Holy Communion, because why? He would start taking it to himself. And he would be called in the Hebrew manuscripts, not desolation as it's translated in English, but the desolator, which is to say the entity that destroys, because that is one of Satan's name, the destroyer. Say it in the Greek, Apollyon. Say it in the Hebrew, Ababdon. The destroyer, over and over. It's very difficult to confuse them. Why then is it not taught that people should be warned? That's what watchmen are about. Watchmen for the Lord Jesus Christ. Christian watchmen 
are to warn people that the false Christ comes at the sixth trump. The true Christ doesn't return until the seventh. We have work to do. Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, and there he shall sit until his enemies are made his footstool, and you, by the Holy Spirit speaking through you, will have a little something to do with bringing that to pass. Yeah, Christ gave him quite a Bible study. Men, I would sure like to have been there. I would like to have sit through that as he took them through the scriptures all the way back through the writings of Moses. And then we return then to the 24th chapter, the 28th verse. Let's read it. And they drew nigh unto the village. I mean, he's been teaching them all that seven and a half miles. Whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. He didn't, he didn't identify himself. They should have known by then, certainly. 29, but they constrained him. They hung on to him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. When they invited him, he came in. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever invited him into your house? Have you ever invited him into your life? Do you just let him go on by? You see, the invitation's got to be made on your part. It takes a little action on your part to invite him in. Make sure that you do invite him into your life. It makes a big difference. It brings you peace of mind. And he takes care of those things that you cannot. Verse 30, And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and he blessed it and break and gave to them. Isn't it strange? He didn't say this time, this is my body. He was simply partaking. He's in a transformed body and he's still partaking. 31, And their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. Mike, he's in a different dimension. This is something you have to be aware of. He's in his transformed body. Verse 32, And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us uh, while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? It was fantastic. That's why I say, boy, would I love to have been there. What a Bible lesson. Verse 33, and they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and then that were with them. This is to let you know that neither of these two was one of the eleven. Okay. Verse 34, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And that's to say Peter. Verse 35, And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking bread. He he had um, chowed down with them, and he had uh, been a part, a teacher. He's still that teacher. When they invited him in, verse 36, and as they thus spake, and this is in front of the eleven, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Now, how did he get there? Did he, uh, there, I, want, I want you to think in terms of dimensions a moment. Did, um, did he need a door to come through? No, he did not. Why? He's in a different dimension. That does not mean the wall and the door is not still there because it's in this dimension. But Christ being resurrected was in a different dimension and could make himself visible to us or not. Now, this is why that many times you never know when you pray and when you ask for help, you never know what's just above your head. You never know how God sends uh, uh, help and protects those that love Him, those that teach His Word, those that follow Him. How precious it is to have that presence of the living God. So always feel secure when you invite him in, for now that spirit, the Holy Spirit, is his spirit. 
and he wants to be with you. He wants to be around you. He wants to be in you, to use you as a watchman to watch and discern the events and the times. Let's go with the next verse, 37. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. I mean, it, it shook them up. I mean, just a whoop, he appeared right there. 38, and he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do thoughts rise in your hearts? You know, he had taken Peter and John them up to the Mount of Transfiguration and had they were uh, sitting back and here um, he appears with Moses and Elijah in transfigured bodies, glistening bright. And they had seen it and he said, don't tell anybody about this until after the resurrection. That would be now, whereby they can understand this transfigured body. He said, why, why are you troubled and why, why do these thoughts, why, why can't you get your act together? Again, I'm going to remind you, it was written. All you had to do was read it. All they had to do was to listen to it. Verse 39, behold my hands and my feet. Look, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. as this transfigured body, okay? We do have spirit. We have spirit. That is the intellect of our soul. And it is the Holy Spirit in his case, for it is his spirit that he can magnify, that he can lead, guide, and direct, but it's not his body, nor is it yours. But we do all have a spiritual body. And he was in not quite like a spiritual body, but a transfigured body. Verse 40, And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. Doctor, they were, they were pierced. He'd been nailed to the cross. 41, And while they yet believed not for joy, they were romping, they were happy, and wondered, he, and wondered, he said unto them, Have you here any meat? Was this to put them at ease? Don't, don't ever take just milk. And I'm speaking spiritually here. You want meat. You want the depth of the Word of God, the truth, to sustain you. That's why you invite Him in. It's where you have the deeper understanding of the simplicity in which He teaches. Always invite Him in. You want to study? Invite him in. He is a teacher of teachers. Verse 42, And they gave him a piece of boiled fish and of an honeycomb. Honeycomb being the food of prophets and fish being that that would be the cipher which would be his name. Yeshua, that is to say Jesus, uh, Savior of Israel. And so it is that he was. Uh, that's why the fish is drawn as the sign of Christianity. Verse 42. And they gave him, uh, we, and 43 to continue, and he took it and did eat before them to set them at ease. 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. All that is recorded, all you got to do is read it. Okay? Invite him in to assist you if you have trouble with it. 45, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Just do you ever pray for understanding or ask Him for understanding when something is difficult? You need to simplify it whereby a child can even understand? Then ask Him. Let Him open your mind to the simplicity of His teachings. How do you do that? You invite Him in. He will never let you down as long as you don't let Him down. 
46. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, to raise from the dead the third day. I mean, it was prophesied over and over. It came to pass. And where? In Psalms 22, it was told even the words that, that would be spoken, as we've covered many times. Verse 47, And that repentance and remissions of sins should be preached in His name, in whose name? In His name. Among all nations, that's plural, it means all ethnic people, whomsoever will. Not just Israel, all nations beginning at Jerusalem. That's the barometer. That's the touch place. That's the place the Antichrist will appear. That is the place Christ will return, that same Mount of Olives in which he departed. Verse 48, And ye are witnesses of these things. You've seen it. You report it. 49, And behold, I send the promise of my Father unto you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Well, what power is that? The Holy Spirit. Forty days he would be with them. That's probation. And then he would tell them, as he's about to depart, wait in that city ten days later. That would be the fiftieth day. Then that Holy Spirit, which caused both the sons and the daughters to prophesy and teach, which is what will happen after the Antichrist appears on this earth when the Holy Spirit wishes to speak through you. Invite him in. Verse 50, And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now where is Bethany? This is important. Bethany is on the Mount of Olives. It was a place he spent much time. It is the place he left, and it is the place he will return to. This is where his feet will touch the ground, even as it is written in the Old Testament in the book of Zechariah chapter 14. And so it is that as he left, so he shall return. Verse 51, And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven, right to the right hand of Almighty God, Verse 52, and they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. They had witnessed all this. 53, and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Do you know what amen means? It means that's that. Take it or leave it. That's the way it is. So, and it is so precious. That's the book of Luke. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I've enjoyed bringing it to you. It is the light giver. You know, Luke was a physician, a medical doctor. He brought things forth in a way that really is so easily understood. But there we have that account. And what you want to make sure you do is don't, don't let Christ go by you. What do you mean? Well, invite him in. All you have to do is ask him, talk to him. That's what prayer is. Let him know you love him. And most of all, you be a watchman in this end generation, this generation of the fig tree. Do that. Let him know you're going to. Ask him to use you, and he will. All right, bless your hearts. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting light in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. 
The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. Why? Well, we don't judge people. We have a judge. It's our Father. Leave all the judging to Him. You do have the spiritual gift of discernment, if you've earned it whereby you can tell truth from fiction and you have the right to discern who you want to study with, who you want to fellowship with, and who you wish to spend that time being a watchman and serving the living God. Just simply letting Him know you love Him and by inviting Him in. It's so very precious. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. It's always a pleasure. Now, you got a prayer request, you don't need the number, don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. He has time for you. He always hears you. He will answer when it's best for you, according to His plan, not yours, His plan. And that's the, if you love Him, that's the way you want it. Father, around the globe we come, Father. Watchmen of the end times, use each of them, Father. Bless them. Touch them in Jesus' precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with Jim from California. When the Antichrist comes, is he going to try and convert us to other religion? Or will he tell you that you are condemned if you do not convert to, to that religion? No, he's coming not to convert you, but to strengthen. His message will be to strengthen Christianity or he will be all in all to everyone because he's supernatural. He will be every religion's answer. And as all religions tie in, as he said, this is why he chooses um, the holy place in Jerusalem to set his so-called throne, as it is written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, because many religions, all major religions, that's where their head is. That's where they think their head is. And so it will be. But he wants to strengthen you. He claims to be Christ, so he wants you to be a Christian. He will, and so the conversion is simply not a conversion, but deception. It's what, that's why Christ didn't warn you about conversion. He warned you about deception. Don't be deceived. Um, I'm from Virginia. I'm Heidi and I'm 10 years old. I want to know, we have three horses and one horse had to be put down. Will God forgive us for it and will we see her when we go to heaven? Me and my mom are very sad. She'll, she'll be um, with me wherever I go. Well, the, you know, um, it takes a great deal of love when someone, when and one of our pets or livestock needs to be put down, it takes special love to bring that to pass. And God loves his animals. God loves your animals. And as you read in, in uh, Isaiah chapter 11, we're going to have animals with us in heaven, our animals, and that's why God created them. Because he, he loves them, we love them. Uh, don't you all be all that sad. That shows great love for that one that you put down because they needed your help and you gave it to them. Um, Father will be proud of you, you can rest assured. Maxine from Minnesota. During the millennium, when Christ returns, will these be new life, will there be new life born or, or death? No, neither, because we're all in spiritual bodies at the seventh trump, okay? Will people live to be a thousand years old? People will live for an eternity. A thousand years is just the time of the millennium. That's one day with the Lord, okay? 
But those that overcome will live forever. That's eon after eon after eon. But those that don't make it, it's over for them. Kaput. All done. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, when the heavens will pass away and the earth will be burned up, what about all the believers and unbelievers? Where will they be? Well, it's, it's a mistranslation that you have to understand. Read that 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 again. It's the elements, the rudiments that are burned up. Take Galatians chapter 4, verses 3 and verse 9. I'm going to say it one more time. Galatians chapter 4, verse 3 and 9. Let you know what happens to those elements, those beggarly, miserable elements. It's the wickedness of the world is going to be gone. God's going to establish His kingdom here on earth. It's not going to be gone, okay, or burned up. Okay, uh, we got Rob from Kentucky. Could you please help me document that the last generation started when Israel became a nation in 1948? Jeremiah 24.6. Jeremiah 24.6. Both fig baskets, the good and the bad. And when Judah would go back to Jerusalem and establish a nation, that would begin the generation of the, of the fig tree. How many times did that happen? Just once? Well, when was that? 1948? Does Shepherd Chapel have a DV or that explains the parable of the fig tree? Well, we have, I'm, I'm not sure you can call and ask, but we do have a tape titled Parable of the Fig Tree that will help you. Uh, Sharon, from, Sharon Lee from California. Uh, I've, Pastor Murray, I've heard you say when we're delivered up to the Antichrist, we must let the Holy Spirit speak through us. W well, do Christians and infants also get delivered up? Do children and infants also get delivered up? Do they have to endure the five months? Uh, no one is ever going to have over 10 days. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Um, uh, but only a child, you know, we've got some children that look forward to standing against him. We have children that know the word. They are above the age of accountability. Uh, they're real troopers. You can, you can tell by the, the many of the children that write this uh, questions to this ministry. They're well informed. You might say, well, why are they well informed? Because they study chapter by chapter and verse by verse and enjoy it. So uh, there will be no babies delivered up and you must remember what did it pro what did God promise in Luke 21 not one hair on your head will be harmed. Neither will the children, neither will the infants. This dude is coming back to play Jesus, savior, nice guy. And that's how he has to act or people would know he was a fake. But that doesn't mean we can um, have anything to do with him. We still stand against him. Sharon Lee from California, during the five months when Satan is here, this is the same person, is here. I heard you say we should not use money to buy things, that we should keep stuff to barter with. Well, I, no, no, you kind of misunderstand. Before you could, naturally, when he brings in the one world order, there will be new money printed. The money we have now will be, unless it's precious metal, is of no value. Or, or exchanged, but you have to worship him, that's to say the false Christ, in your mind before you're going to get any of that money, that finance, or any blessings from him. We cannot go there. That's why that you always want to have its best. It, uh, God always takes care of his own, and you, no, one, no one need worry about that, but... Um, he will take care of his own, but it's kind of nice to have a, if you have a little precious metal, silver, you can trade or barter with somebody that uh, is taking the money and buying bread and stuff to get bread, okay? Ronnie from Kentucky, has God ever destroyed a nation for sin without warning them first through someone like Jonah? No, he hasn't. He warned Sodom and Gomorrah over and over. 
and even made, uh, I mean, there was a righteous man there. It was Lot. And there was many warnings. They would not listen. They would not adhere. Perversion was a muck. And God said, in, no more. And he destroyed it. Opal from Oregon, are the Trump symbolic or will we hear them sound so that we will know when to count and what they are? You won't hear them. There, it's a, what you learn from the Trumps is the events that transpire so you know that you're in that Trump when, in, when those things happen. You know, there's already been five of them, so we didn't hear them. But when you're familiar with the scripture, you know that those five have passed or have come to, to, to fulfillment uh, because of the events that transpired. It's all brought out in the great book of Revelation, meaning the unveiling, that is to say, to be made known. Mary from Indiana, in the end times, are we supposed to protect ourselves with weapons and violence? You, you always, um, against Satan, no. We, we have the weapon, all right. It's the sword of God, which is the truth, the word, the Holy Spirit. But as far as protecting your family and your presence from other beings, self-defense is always the law of the land. Self-defense, self-defense. You always have that right. Satan is not going to try to destroy people. He's trying to convert them to his way, and he's got to do it like Christ would, or they'll know he's a fake. So he's going to be Mr. Nice Guy as far as conversion is concerned. But when someone is taken in by him, it's a cruel, cruel thing. Because they took the ticket to heaven and exchanged it for a one way to hell. Not nice. Jane from Kentucky. What does the spirit body look like, and do you believe that the souls that are with Christ will burn in hell forever? Um, not souls that overcame. This is up to Almighty God as to who burns in the lake of fire. And it's not, it's, it is to ashes fini. Okay. There, God puts it in a real nice way. He calls it, I'm blotting them out. They don't exist anymore. They won't even exist in your mind that they ever existed, okay? What does a spiritual body look like? Well, we were made in the same image, exact. Only, always remember in the spirit body, there's no age, so they always look young and a young adult. Robin from Texas. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, the King James English says, there is no temptation taken, taken you, but such that is common to man. I'm surrounded by Christians who want to twist that verse to mean there won't be any circumstances come their way that God's not going to get them out of. Uh, that's a false teaching. God doesn't like wimps, okay? He doesn't like poor me babies. What he's saying here is even though you love me, you're in the world, you're in the flesh, and just as they abuse Christ, they're, they're going to try you. And it's going to happen to you. But you can cut it. You're a child of the living God. But he does promise he will never allow it to surpass what you can handle. But the most beautiful thing, read the rest of that verse, he will always show you a way out or through. You can count on it. But he didn't promise, a, they're trying to promise you a rose garden. And what happens about the first time some, Satan yanks their chain and they have a little trouble, they disbelieve God. When all they have to do is they had a false teacher. God is saying, hey, it's kind of tough out there. But you're tough and you can cut it. Why? Because I'm with you and I'll always show you through. I'm never going to let them test you over what you can bear. I always say, if there's quite a bit of trouble coming your way, he knows you're a tough nut. And he's, he knows he can count on you in the end to handle whatever comes along. That's the kind of people God likes. Okay, He doesn't like lazy people. He doesn't like wimps. Susan from Wisconsin, please document the meaning of sacrifices that are spoken of in the latter chapters of Ezekiel 
particularly those in the millennium. It, it naturally, it, when uh, this was written a long time ago and sacrifice was particular things of value. What God wants, though, is you can clarify it in Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. I do not want your burnt offerings. I want your love, your grace, your mercy. He wants you to love Him. That's what you sacrifice. You give Him sacrificial love in that millennium. That's your ticket to heaven. Mark from Kentucky. Do you believe that our pets will be with us in the millennium and in heaven? God loves His animals. We know from documentaries that even in the ancients, millions of years ago, we had the animals here on earth, and uh, God loves them. They all have a purpose. Uh, Tommy from South Carolina, does a love offering cover a multitude of sins? Well, let's, let's state the scripture. The scripture says righteous acts cover a multitude of sins. And a love offering can be considered a, a righteous act, you betcha. And, um, and God loves a cheerful giver, but that's, that is all your business and so be it. Uh, Charles from North Carolina, uh, question, I was born at home in February 1940. I was never circumcised. I don't know why. What, what does God say I should do to be clean and do in the name of Jesus. The circumcision is longer, no longer of the flesh. Circumcision is of the heart. If you love the Lord Jesus Christ, you are circumcised. Don't worry about it. Circumcision for hygiene, per, for, uh, in hygiene, it's fine if that's what somebody chooses, but biblically it has no importance any longer. Circumcision is of the heart. It ha applies to both men and women. Alfred from California, is the soul and the spirit the same thing? Please explain the difference. The soul and the spirit are not, I repeat, not the same thing. The soul is yourself, your very being, whichever body you're in, flesh or spiritual body. Your spirit is always a part of the soul because it is your intellect. It is your thought process. It is how you treat others. You let your spirit go out to touch others. Is it good or is it hateful? Does it disrupt or does it bring truth and does it bring love? I don't know. That's up to each individual and each individual spirit. Christ's spirit is the Holy Spirit and it always you want to invite him in. Uh, Carol from California. I am Carol from California. I have a question about my sister who recently passed just before Christmas. She was saved and is she all right now? When I saw her, will I see her again when I pass? Yes, she will. You, we know that from Ezekiel chapter 44, verses 25, 20 through 25, that, which is the millennium when we're all in spiritual bodies, that we still recognize our, our loved ones. But your sister who passed, uh, if she was saved, she, that, that means the Lord loves her. She loved the Lord. And what is it that John 3.16 says? God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe upon him, salvation, should never perish, but have eternal life. She has eternal life. Uh, Question for Pastor Murray from Jennifer from Connecticut. When God says something in the Bible and the way he says it, he is so specific. Verse 1. Why was God so specific to record rumors of wars in Matthew 24? And number 2. Are those rumors happening now and did God indicate them in Revelation? Well, but the main thing he wanted you to know, though, is the end wasn't as long as you could hear of rumors of wars. But what's the opposite of rumors of wars? That's what you want to be on more specific about. It's peace. They cry, peace, 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 but there will be no peace until the true Christ returns. You can count on it. But um, we're, we're hearing quite a bit about rumors right now, but... Um, don't worry, uh, the peace, peace talks will come following it. Bob from Connecticut. The other question, this, let's see. 
Pastor Murray, a few questions I have for you. Is there a place in the Bible where it says that presently hell doesn't exist, which I believe I heard you say before since it's Satan's new dominion? Well, you know, the reason as a student of God's word, I know what the words translated hell actually are. It's grave, sepulchre, and garbage dump, Gehenna. That's not the lake of fire, which doesn't exist until the end of the millennium. So that's your proof. You know how easy it is? Take your Strong's Concordance, and every time the word hell is used, it will either be grave, supplica, or garbage pit. With the exception of one exemption, and I'm not even going there, the holding place. The other question is regarding the highly polished bronze brass vehicle that carried the Ark of the Covenant in the book of Ezekiel. Does this mean there were other such vehicles that God, their vehicles are used? Yes, that's God's word in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, there's a lot we don't know about it, but they're certainly not unidentified to Almighty God. Uh, Richard from South Carolina. One question, 1 Timothy 3.12, a deacon must be the husband of one wife and must manage his children and his household well. Uh, this created a lot of, I'm going to have to hold this one over and handle it in the next lecture because I am out of time and it'll take more of the time than I can squeeze in. I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Most of all, God loves you for it, makes his day. Just invite him in and absorb that word because it's a letter he's written to you telling you how to function and be blessed in these flesh bodies even. That's, it makes his day, and when you make his, he's sure going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, hey, you bless God, he will always bless you. But most important, though, you listen to me, listen good. Stay in his word. Every day, and it's a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.